Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome in joining us for the President's Design Award 2020 Recipients Forum Part 1, Creating a Better World by Design, Designing with and for Communities. My name's Audrey Lim, and I will be your MC for today. The President's Design Award, or DPA for short, is Singapore's highest accolade for designers and designs across all disciplines. Organized by the Design Singapore Council and the Urban Redevelopment Authority, this is the 13th cycle of the award. On 30, 30th June, 11 recipients were presented with their awards during the PDA 2020 award ceremony. In the first of the two-part series, today's recipients forum features six of the President's Design Awards 2020 recipients. They will share how their awarded projects and body of work have transformed and impacted the lives of people from all walks of life, from the very young to the elderly, to multi-generational families and marginalized communities. Before we delve into the session proper, I'd like to highlight a couple of house rules just to keep today's session running as smoothly as possible. Please be informed that this webinar will be recorded and that your microphones will be automatically set on mute throughout the session. We most definitely welcome questions during the Q&A segment, and you may submit these questions through the Zoom Q&A function. Should you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to our technical team through the Zoom chat function. Last but not least, this forum will be accredited to CPD points. For those of you who would like to apply for CPD points, do fill in the details required in the survey form at the end of the forum. Without further ado, let's welcome architect Larry Ung, Prize Secretary for the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize, Commissioner General for Singapore Pavilion at Dubai World Expo 2020, Registrar, Board of Architects, to say a few words. Thank you, Audrey. Well, distinguished speakers who are our most distinguished PDA recipients for 2020, Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. And for those that are joining us from Europe, America, Asia, and even ASEAN, a very good day to all of you and hope you enjoy the session today. Welcome and thank you for joining us online. First time I think we're doing that because of COVID-19 for the part one of the President's Design Award 2020 Recipients Forum. This forum is organized for the public and the design community to find out more about the inspiration and thinking behind the designers and designs awarded in the 2020 President's Design Award and how good architecture and design have the power to shape the society we live in. Over the years, the stature of the award has grown as design becomes increasingly important to Singapore as a driver of innovation. The award honors the significant achievements and contributions of the nation's design talents who manage to push boundaries to create innovative and impactful solutions that address local and global issues such as the aging societies, underserved communities, sustainability and climate change, etc. This cycle of PDA saw the designer of the year category being awarded to two designers and the designs of the year category to nine designs. <clears throat> the quality of our homegrown designs is getting increasingly sophisticated. Our designers are also well placed to create works and transcend cultures, promote sustainability, and resolve contextual challenges in meaningful ways. Today, we have six recipients, four from the architecture discipline and two from the design discipline. They will be sharing their design philosophies, creative processes, their challenges, and how they have overcome them. 
through this sharing, I hope you all will gain a deeper understanding and appreciation of the transformative role of design on communities, as well as the impact that these innovative designs have in adding vibrancy to the built environment and in improving people's lives. I also hope that this forum will inspire all of us towards architecture and design excellence. I will now hand the time back to Audrey to introduce the speakers and please have a pleasant afternoon. Over to you, Audrey. Thanks for that architect, Larry. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President's Design Awards 2020 recipients on our panel today. Mm -hmm. Designer of the Year recipients, architect Ku Bing Ping and architect Belinda Huang, directors, Arc Studio Architecture and Urbanism Private Limited. Design of the Year recipient, Cloister House, represented by architect Alan Tay and architect Sito Kamlun, principal partners, Formworks Architects. Design of the Year recipient, Sparkle Tots Large Preschool at Pongol, represented by architect Ho Zhu Yin, founding partner and managing director, Lord Architects. Design of the Year recipient, Atania Green School, represented by Mr. Prasoon Kumar, co-founder, Billion Bricks Limited. Design of the Year recipient, Good Life Makan, represented by architect Xia Chi Huang, Chief Executive Officer, DP Architects Private Limited. Design of the Year recipient, Kampong Admiralty, represented by architect Pearl Chi, Director, Woha Architects Private Limited. Let's welcome our first pair of speakers, architect Ku Bing Ping and architect Belinda Huang to kick off the session. The duo founded Arc Studios in 1999 and since then have scaled new heights with their high rise, high density and award winning developments such as Pinnacle at Duxton and the Tembusu. Today, they will share how the power of architecture can better humankind and create environments that promote hospitality. Architect Ku and Architect Huang, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Hi, everyone. Uh, our sharing today is called The Architecture of Our Common Home, uh, Planet Earth being our only home. This picture shows everything we love, the sun, the blue skies, and sea, uh, with a wooden handmade jetty. And in the background, you can see our family. Uh, as designers, we ask ourselves a lot of questions. Uh, chiefly, how do we strive uh, thrive as a human race in a safe and just world. This is our twin challenge today, environmental restoration and social justice. How can we ensure social justice and restore our environment at the same time? What does it mean to be human? And how can we have enough food for all without cutting down the very forest that produces oxygen and water for us? The COVID pandemic challenge has affected all of us. It is not the only pandemic in history, and yet we have never been more interconnected and interdependent. COVID has exaggerated the social ruptures in our society. Can architecture be designed to heal? Our climate became stable only about 11,000 years ago, allowing culture to form, and only about 100 years ago that we were able to thrive with the rise of technology. With the atomic bomb, we gain the power to destroy ourselves and geologists start to call this a uh, new epoch, Anthropocene, where human beings is able to affect geological time. How do we navigate into safe Anthropocene, avoiding the rupture? Ping Bing and I sat down during the circuit breaker to just examine ourselves and to realign our mission and purpose. Inspired by the Japanese concept of Ikigai, this diagram shows how we try to bring our projects as close as possible to the intersection of four circles. Our values, what we believe, our expertise, what we are good at, what the world needs, and how the projects are financed. Hospitality is our first value. We love how Henry Nouwen puts it. Hospitality is the creation of free space where strangers enter to become friends. 
In this picture on the right, we hosted a workshop in Cambodia with the students whom we were designing for. Our architects told us that the students blessed them with joy and gave them meaning in their work. Love and justice goes hand in hand. We see love as an action and as a relationship. We see justice as restorative and not punitive. It is not to punish, but to protect and to restore peace, order. Love is interesting because it is not something we can ask for or something we can store up for later. It is something that we have to give away in order for us to receive. The more we give, the more we receive. Connection. We believe that we are all made to connect. For that, we need vulnerability. We like Brene Brown's definition where a connection exists when we derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. We strive to create spaces of connection with ourselves, with others, with nature, and with the divine. What are some key guiding principles for us? We have seven. First, we align all our projects to the current ESG paradigm. The United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal has uh, the first four goals, zero poverty, zero hunger, health for all, and quality education is woven as much as possible into our practice. We try to think in cycles and in, in, circular, in a circular manner. We are very happy that the latest version of GM 2021 has aligned itself with the UN SDG and other glo global goals. And at the bottom left is Kate Raver's donut economy. The outer ring describes the nine planetary boundaries, uh, which we have to keep within to keep our planet safe. And the inner ring is the social foundation uh, provision of food, education, and water for all. Ecology means more than just forests and animals. It also means human relationships and organizations. Understanding cultural ecology is critical as history and culture is alive and ever evolving. The first thing we did for our Rwanda project was to visit the Genocide Museum to feel and to cry with the people, like to immerse ourselves. We have dialogues, listening deeply to the words and to the hearts of the people. As designers, we learn to encourage and to empower local communities. We understand that the quality of daily life is not something that we can impose from the outside, but un understood within the world of symbols and customs. We draw from various disciplines, including social sciences and neuroscience. Our designs try to integrate as many different contexts as possible. We strive for a beauty beyond just the material, but also the beauty of trust, of care, of peace, and of connection. How attractive are those cities in their architectural design when they are full of spaces which connect, relate, and favor the recognition of others? As designers, we learn to find our authentic self so that we can be fully present with humility. Every person on earth has an inalienable rights to his or her integral development. When we lose respect for the human person, we lose the social peace, stability and security provided by a certain order that looks after the common good. In our present global society, injustice and basic human rights deprivation still abounds. Um, the principle of common good is a call to reach out to the last and the least. As architects and designers, how can we respond more to what the world needs and less to what the world pays? Our world is a gift we have freely received and must share with others. We cannot view our world as a utilitarian means to profit the individual we realize that intergenerational solidarity and unity is not an option. We cannot just borrow and take without consideration for what we leave for future generations. How do we respect justice between generations in our work? We talk, we share, we create experiences and connections between generations. As designers, we seek to see, see beyond just space, but also across time. 
As architects, we embrace a human-centered approach that requires us to empty ourselves and fill the space with promise, to ignite hearts and to see the eyes of the people around us shine with hope. We look at the entire experience from our first conversation to the process of building and conflict res resolution. Our aim is to create architecture that integrates nature and technology. We see technology as a tool in the service of integral ecology, and we see design as research where we are learning, doing, and seeing at the same time. Computational tools are used to help us, uh, help us to deal with more and more data and to help us to see with other lenses and in many different ways, opening up for us ever greater possibilities and prospects. Our integrated process has four stages that mimic design thinking methods, discovering with compassion, defining mindfully, developing joyfully, and delivering with gratitude. It is not always easy. We constantly have to reflect and examine where we have fallen off the circle and constantly find ourselves climbing back on. But to us, our work is love made visible. And what does it mean to work with love? It is to build a house with affection, even as if your beloved were to dwell in that house. Our Arc Studio journey started with the design of single family homes. We love our homes uh, to be orderly, calm, open, filled with natural light and air, and surrounded by nature. As our projects grew in complexity, we learned to express the desires of our clients. Um, the house on the top is a home for, collector, for a collector. We turn his collection into a facade. And the house below expresses the preference of the husband for more rectilinear forms and the wife for more curvilinear forms. Single homes become high-density, high-rise collective homes. The Pinnacle at Dutston has stood the test of time and was recently awarded the CTBUH 10-Year Excellence Award for Sustainability and Social Impact. 90% of the project was precast, including the sky bridges. We continue to explore technology to create identity. We strive to use simple rules to create complex results and finding intelligent solutions to complex problems. After completing the Pinnacle at Duxton, we curated this exhibition together with NUS and made this provocative statement. 1,000 Singapore's can house the entire world population using only 0.5% of the Earth's land area. Super small. That's equivalent to one France or two Japan's very tiny footprint. We brought a 1,000 scale model of Singapore to Venice. Imagine the entire section of an entire nation in a pavilion. We believe that Singapore is a living laboratory for complex cities of the world, cities with the smallest possible ecological footprint. Every project in Singapore, therefore, makes a difference to this conversation. In Kolkata, we attended weddings, learned Vastu, and visited homes to understand how to design bungalows in the air. The cloud form is a reference to Tagore's Deya, a cloud pregnant with promise. The Tembusu draws inspiration from the origins of Wing Tai as a garment factory. Drapery, strings, and lightness were themes woven together in the tapestry of sky gardens and ecology. In Sentosa, the sea and the fluid lines of waves and kelp forest help us to design uh, an 800-room hotel over a bus terminus. The environmental deck is a waterscape of pools of different age groups and multiple uses, from sunbathing to uh, a stage for music and even a fashion show. Right next door, sharing the same compact service network, is a restoration project. What was once military used for surveillance of the sea lanes is now a luxury hotel for private getaways. What was once a parade square for soldiers now holds wedding marches. From hostility to hospitality, a project riding on the waves of spiral dynamic development. The next project is in the highlands of Malaysia and it has taught us all about biodiversity and the forest. We learned from the indigenous tribes from permaculture and learned about protecting our natural capital. How do we develop a new town in the rural highlands, creating a new economy around sustainability? 
safe farms, education and tourism, and yet regrow an entire forest to restore what was once locked before. On this columbarium project, we transform what was once a dark and scary space with energy wells bringing natural light, gardens and water into the basement. Instead of a place to be feared and avoided, it has become a space where people go to meditate and to contemplate. We restored the Wesley Methodist Church by keeping the new extensions quiet and framing the original church. We restored the processional aisle and clarified the original architecture in the process, forming a new dialogue between the old and the new. In Cambodia, we use simple low-cost material like L-angles and PVC tubes to create a school with a unique identity. What really moved us was how a girl was sold off to prostitution. She was later bought back by the nuns and is now an architect. Without this school, many of the children will end up after grade six in factories or in the flesh trade. As architects, we bring our work to make our world a little bit better. We listen with compassion and humility, becoming more aware of ourselves and striving to improve a little every day. We create spaces that host all and use technology to improve daily lives. We see safe, safe farms and straw being turned into building panels rice plantation and fish farms on rooftops, a forest in a condo. We protect nature and even improve upon it wherever we go. This is our heart for our common home as designers and as architects. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that sharing architect Ku Pengbing and architect Belinda Huang. That insightful sharing has moved all of us. Uh, next, we have architect Alan Tay and architect Sito Kamlun, principal partners of Formworks Architects, whose numerous projects have received critical acclaim around the world, including awards from Singapore Institute of Architects, the International Architecture Awards, and the Design for Asia Awards. May I now call upon architect Alan Tay to share on Cloister House, a fresh and artful representation of a courtyard house that was designed for a family living in the tropics. Architect Tay, over to you. Hi everyone, great to be here to share our project, the Cloister House. Yeah, this is the team, we begin a, begin a project, this is a team that is behind this, obviously there are others, uh, Iskandar, I think I believe you're in the audience that has been offer tremendous contribution to the project, but this is a threesome that, that, that saw it through and we have tremendous time uh, doing the project and I'm really grateful for that. I'm here speaking because probably I'm the fastest mouth among three. Uh, this is the project, it is in JB across the street um, on the sitting on a land size of 47,000 square feet, a very large piece of real estate. Just to put in perspective, the, that's the size in comparison of the projects of houses that we have done in Singapore over the last two decades, in, uh, from, from semi-detached to bungalows, the GCB. But this is something that uh, we were confronted was really new and huge. We set us thinking. And in comparison of scale, was that if, if uh, we were to accommodate about a uh, 15,000 square feet of space, which is more than comfortable for the single family. Uh, everything on one story, this is what it takes uh, on the land. And that set us thinking that, that we, we begin to see, and, and there's always been our dream to build a single story house. Because of obvious reasons, so it's super universal, it is accessible, and whenever you are, you are super connected to any part of the house, you are next to your land, you are next to your roof as well, of the benefit of a, of a, of a single story house. And of course, with such a deep plan, um, and also part of the brief requirement for security, the idea of fortification, the idea of uh, creating an introverted space that's secure for kids when they're too young, the husband travel quite a fair bit, that was some consideration of looking at courtyard typology. And and you can see normally you know, a simple layout would be a huge courtyard that organized the, the different blocks within the house. Or we could begin to see and visualize that would there be possibility of multiple courtyards? What would that uh, engender? 
with this uh, these these configurations. We begin to look at um, the the three projects seen from plans. Of, on the left is Jeffrey Bauer's uh, famous thirty three, the third the, sorry thirty third lane Colombo, and on the right the middle one is a Chrysler House plan, and the the on the right is the house in Pompeii, which is which is the left of it. And to study really, these are courtyard houses. And of course, there are numerous examples in the like, famous Sihui and in China that is always a kind of reference of what could we do when we want to create this new uh, tropical courtyard design. And the final result was, was 12 courtyards, um, all in green. Um, you have 11 courtyards that are smaller that perforate throughout the main block and the bigger one at the rear. A quick look at the plan. So this is the, the courtyard begin to organize the various spaces. Just to orientate such complex plan and I'll move faster. The blue zone is where the guest rooms are to keep the house in laws. On the bottom, we have the staff quarters, uh, really a like two bedroom apartment with their own common spaces, living rooms, quarters, and, 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 and workspace. The play space for the kids, the entertainment in red. And then these are the kids' immediate bedrooms, the three sons, the three kids with the master, sharing a common space, a family space. And the rest is all common, a kind of continuous corridor a kind of cloister around the courtyards, but common spaces of living, dining, eating, um, drinking, uh, playing. And, and one of the benefits of this courtyard realized is that in terms of uh, landscape and garden, immediately you could have this domesticated size or scale of garden that you can manage and almost instantaneous gratification or relative to the scale of the courtyards. They don't have to wait forever for them to grow. Wow. On the periphery, we anticipate the plant, the trees grow, take a longer life cycle, maybe 10 to 15 years to grow, so they can come in young and, and establish themselves over the time. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna really be fast. So, a quick look at what it is elevation from the streets in the daytime, the roofscape, rudimentary, functional, because it's hardly see from the facade, all you see is really the soft fit. In the internal spaces, how the courtyard defines the various spaces with the different variation of roof that hangs over the spaces. I'll just go very quick. And you have different pockets of spaces, narrow, tight, interconnected. And this is a view from the back of the bigger courtyard looking back at the main house. Ah, I'm quite fast. And then I come to the last slide. I have some about 50 seconds left. So yes, this is the view of uh, when it's night. Oh, I see that, sorry. <laughs> it's really fast. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think we'll take any questions at the interview uh, or the, the Q&A, yeah. That's it. Thanks for that really speedy presentation, Architect Alan Tay. Uh, our next speaker is Architect Ho Zhu Yin, founding partner and managing director, Lord Architects, who views architecture as a lens through which one understands the wider world. He will share on Sparkle Touch Large Preschool at Pongol, one of the first mega childcare centers in Singapore. Let us hear how the unique design of the preschool created a joyful and experiential learning environment for the children. Architect Ho, over to you. Ooh, Architect Ho, we might need you to unmute yourself. I see, there you are. Okay, you're back. Thank you. Well, good job, Alan. I try to do as, as well as you. <laughs> Five minutes. Okay, so so um, basically, when our client Sparkle Thoughts approached us, um, they have uh, quite a challenging task. We were assigned to build a childcare for one thousand children, 
um, and in a, in a period of uh, 11 months. And this for the childcare is for kids that ranges from a, 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 an infant to four years old. So it's really a early years center. So after five months of design and tenure, the, the project started to construct and we managed to finish it within 10 and a half months. Um, so just a bit of understanding before I did a childcare, my simplistic understanding of childcare was really a place for them to play, eat and sleep. But in reality, it's, it's actually much more than that. Um, we realized to design a childcare, we need to provide, we need to think in terms of safety, comfort, and provide a learning environment for the very young. So what does that mean? Um, for the very young, they really learn by play um, in specifically for auditory, visual, tactile learning. Um, it is really the, um, the engagement of their bodies with the environment that it, they start to learn. So these are the themes that I will touch on brief, very briefly um, throughout the slides. So the site is pretty much situated in right in the middle of our housing board estate in Pongo. The immediate challenge was of course a thousand kids. You know, how do you design a childcare for a thousand kids? Because um, this, this was the first time um, something is like that is done to this scale in Singapore. Um, we approached the challenge by segmenting it into three parts. So it, it's basically around 300 each and the, the center had a principle for each. So this theme of three became quite prevalent throughout the center. So there are three principles. The building is divided into three, has three cores. Secondly, the idea of uh, tra the safety from vehicular traffic, because our worst fears was that from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., 1,000 cars come and drop off children. So uh, the whole building is really designed like the island where there are vehicle circulation and drop off points throughout the perimeter. That also helps to engender the circular form. Thirdly, disease outbreak. As you may know, um, every now and then there are outbreaks of hand foot mouth disease in child care. So again, the center is designed to be easily segmented such that they are individual access. Um, on hindsight, this, this uh, design philosophy seems prescient in, in terms of a COVID outbreak. So this is something that we can continue to improve for our further child cares and schools. Next, the idea, the challenge of scale. We were, these are very young kids from zero to four years old. We were kind of concerned that the 40 meters diameter will overpower them in terms of the perception of scale and height. So in response, we've broken down the whole space into three segments again with the multi-purpose hall right in the middle um, to further down, to further bring down the scale. So this is what you see the final building product. You could see that the whole ground floor space is segmented into trees, each with its own theme, um, a playground for infants and toddlers, water play, and the entrance. Um, also, going into the classrooms itself, we paid attention to the fact that actually our users are really not more than a meter tall. So um, sidelines, sidelines into the classrooms, looking at their friends and all that, it is really designed, sidelines and furniture are really designed according to their scale. Next, um, the idea of environmental strategies, because we envision a place where a, a, a childcare, where they can play freely in uh, natural air, but of course sheltered from the sun. And it, it is such a large space that it will really be, and it, energy guzzling to, to air condition whole space. So what we devised was really a high Teflon roof, sheltered area, but designed to allow airflow to go through and also um, augmented by HVLS fans. So in the section, you will see that um, it's really a very light roof to let in natural light um, and ventilation. Right in the middle, we had this idea that uh, we didn't want the children to be isolated from the environment. Um, if, it, if it is a, a bright sunny day, the, the sun should shine right in. If, it's, uh, if there's a tropical outpour, the rain should really come in. So, so we managed to convince the client to leave a big oculus right in the middle of the, of the building, such that the rain comes through. 
So this idea of being in touch with, with nature is really important for us. So the diagrams were conceived um, over a few weeks and um, because of the clarity, we literally in the final plan, we could literally just build from the diagram itself. And you can notice that uh, because of the high speed of construction, all the classrooms were very modular. The entrance foyer. And this is the, the entry plaza that will greet visitors. Um, imbued within throughout the childcare, it's, it's this idea of movement and play. So in every sense of the word, every corner you would have playground or you would have a ramp that encourages children to run and play. Even when um, the, these two slides actually at the entrance and uh, pickup area, we, we thought it'd be great you know, to have slides to occupy them while waiting for their parents to pick them up. And even when during dining, in the dining, main dining hall, you could have very clear visibilities to the playgrounds outside. Water play, infant and toddler play areas, and connected the different floors, instead of making them um, block staircases, uh, we actually created a circular ramp that connects the various floors from ground all the way up to the roof. Second story. Um, Related to the idea of play and learning, it's the idea of um, learning through tactile sensations. So the idea of using mosaics and using colors to help them differentiate the rooms of the classrooms. Um, instead of just relying on alphabets or names, we actually created a series of um, diagrams, cute little diagrams that are based on um, segments of circles and the idea of this continuous spectrum of colors, again, um, we've referenced back to this, um, the Sparkle Talks logo, such that it marks and pervades the whole, all, the whole entire ring of classrooms, and it is brought inside the classrooms itself. So again, this diagram, it's not really specific, um, but it does give some suggestions of the preachers, and we, we, we think that by doing this, it, it ex excites the imagination of the children. And the color themes are brought in through, into each of the classrooms as well. The interior of uh, classrooms, the external corridor. Because of the nature of the Teflon roof and the oculus, you really get a very rich play of light and shadow and the mood um, varies throughout the day. Um, the overall view of the of the, the child care center. And now we re reached the last floor, the roof, and it is really a, a tremendous uh, big continuous circle of play. Um, the way we, we designed this um, space in conjunction with our landscape architect uh, salad dressing, it's really to think of it as uh, slices of pizza that have different flavors as you progress along. So we imagine that when children run along the whole, whole uh, circular ring, they will, they will encounter different ways of play and they could sample the different modes. And this will result in this um, really um, very vibrant, uh, vibrantly populated roofscape. So this is the elevation um, and I've come to my final slide. So we, 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 um, the, the teachers actually asked the children during the opening ceremony to, to, draw, to draw a painting to give their impression of the childcare. So this is the resultant uh, 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 painting. And basically I think they've got down, they got the concept down to a pet. It's just circles of different colors and, and richness and, and uh, diversity. And basically that, that's what we wanted to convey. Um, so really um, to sum up everything, um, what we wanted to create was a space that, uh, a joyous space for the children such that they will actually look forward to coming to school. Um, yeah, and hopefully uh, don't want to leave. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks so much, architect Ho Zuyin. Our next speaker is Mr. Prasoon Kumar, co-founder of Billion Bricks Limited. Mr. Kumar co-founded Billion Bricks in 2013 as a nonprofit to solve the global housing crisis in a completely new way.
Today, he will share about Itania Green School and how the school has created a place of pride and dignity for this marginalized community and catalyzed social change. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, there are about 2.2 billion children in the world uh, who go to school. Uh, many of them study in environments that we are very familiar with in Singapore where they have all the aids. But there are many, many millions of children that actually don't have access to those aids. They don't live in environments or study in environments that we or our children are used to. Their schools do not look like what you see in the picture, but instead are somewhat like this. Often, we send our children for to learn from experiences, from teachers, from aides, but they have to find their own aids through which actually they can learn. Their sports happen in their refugee camps, often if that's what they're living in, and they don't have these inspirational school buildings that we see around us, but often it's just a tree that works as a building for them. I founded uh, Billion Bricks about six years ago uh, with a mission to never design poorly for the poor. Um, my partner, Robert, who's not here, is holidaying in, in, in Europe, came together with me on this journey. And over the last six years, we've impacted about 15,000 lives uh, through various efforts that Billion Bricks has done across the world. Uh, some time ago, Itania approached us to design a school for about 50,000 stateless children that are in Malaysia. Their parents come from Philippines and Indonesia to work deep inside oil palm plantations, which you and I are all familiar with. In some form or the other, we use those products every day in our lives, but we don't know what goes on behind where when the children are born in these plantations, they have access to no citizenship. And therefore, Malaysia does not provide for any uh, access to education for them. Itania runs schools uh, in forests of Borneo, which as you can see in this picture, are fast deteriorating and are being taken away. They hire or they rent spaces in shopping malls uh, or even at times in staircases, but they still are able to provide for a great learning environment for these kids. Uh, that, or at least the pedagogy that they believe in. So for us, it was very clear that these children who are very, who are very much discarded in the society need a place which they can call their own, a school which would give them some pride and dignity and will teach them not only through the aids, but just the experiences of being in the building and the surroundings. Uh, and the goal was really to make sure that these children are not left behind and can be different than what experiences they've had as responsible citizens into the future. The site was quite challenging being close to a river, uh, which um, floods every couple of years. In fact, recently in May, we heard that it flooded almost two feet and the entire site was underwater as well. And we went around and looked in Beaufort, which is where the, where the school is located, to see how they have been dealing with these problems in the past. And it has been quite a challenge. And for us, the obvious thing became that the school had to be lifted up. So imagine if this is the site for the school, which often gets flooded, uh, as you see with the dots all around them. It, the obvious thing for us was to actually take and dig and create a pond where we could actually store some water and create a mound through that water. And that becomes the stepping st uh, stone to get onto the building. We also had access to a couple of shipping containers that we used to prop up and keep the costs very, very low. We had access to some old wood that we used to actually build and really used minimal amount of materials to build the entire school. Uh, and as the school was built, uh, you could see this, there was a central corridor and the classrooms kind of flanked each side of the corridor. The school was also designed so that it could be expanded as the school would expand in the future or the same modules could be taken up and built elsewhere as Itania had ambitious plans to run many, many schools. Uh, the, the school uh, therefore had access to uh, uh, solar panels uh, on top. It harvests its rainwater, cleans its own sewage. And in fact, as you would see later in the pictures, it also grows its own food. Here is a short uh, video of the school. Uh, and I remember going there about a year and a half ago and speaking to some children. And one of the parents came to me and mentioned to me that now our children don't want to come back home because they love studying in the school. And this is really their second home. So it's quite surprising where my own kids don't want to go to school, but the, the environment that we've created has allowed students to take pride and spend more and more time into the school. The space also allows for flexibility to, for people to actually come forward 
and, um, and, and make the space their own. At times, the classrooms become workshop areas or they can become like conference areas where they, the students can hold these conferences. Uh, at times, the corridors become like play areas for the kids and the trees become the classrooms as well. Uh, but the point really is that we have not provided for any flexibility into the school and it really belongs to the, to the parents where you can see they've actually acquired some of the land on the site and they grow their own food uh, and then they set up little shops for children to eat um, in between as well. And then it's all, it's all of course about studies and at the same time about play as well. So in conclusion, I think Itania is an example where with less resources, our goal is to provide the maximum uh, for the children. And like I said, to never ever design poorly for the poor. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Prasoon Kumar. Our next speaker is architect Xia Chi Huang, Chief Executive Officer of DP Architects. He is a firm believer in a people-centric and participatory design process and is actively involved in the engagement of various communities to achieve strategic and synergistic design outcomes in DP Architects projects. Today, he will share about Good Life Makan, a delightful remake of the Senior Activity Center that brings seniors together using the common language of food. Architect Xia, over to you. Thank you, Audrey. So good afternoon, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to present to you today how we aspire to create a better world by design. And this is really true, a special project of ours named Good Life uh, Makan. So this project is a response to the challenge of the silver tsunami of an aging landscape. So Singapore, some may know, has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world. Uh, maybe bad news for some of us in this room. In 2000, uh, 2030, one in four of us will be aged 65 years or more. But more importantly, along with this, there's also a rise in the often forgotten group of stay alone seniors that will almost double in number from 72,000 to 130,000 by 20302. And many of these seniors are susceptible to uh, the dangers of being isolated uh, and suffer from depression. And even unfortunately, in some cases, uh, deaths at home. So hence the question on how can design address the psychological and emotional needs of these vulnerable seniors becomes a primary concerned here. And uh, through the active programming, in this case, of the Agency of Food, we rethink the model of care for these aged seniors. So beyond offering meal support or daycare, we explore how we can tackle the existential and emotional needs of these seniors through purposeful design and programming. Uh, this is some of the statistics of the project. Just to share a clip and give you a sense of the space. So Good Life Makan is a senior activity center. It's sited in the void deck of a public housing in the mature residential estate of Marine Terrace. So our partner here is a social welfare organization, Monford Care. Some will know Makan is to eat in Malay. And fittingly, we have this in the center of the space, the kitchen as the nucleus. And daily, the stay alone seniors in the neighborhood gather here and cook for not just themselves, but also for one another with grocery brought by themselves or donated by charities. So shifting from the conventional door-to-door -door social aid, these seniors are invited to cook for each other, and in this case, especially those in greater need. And through the ritual of food preparation, eating, washing up, the spaces create opportunities for interaction. So the design of Good Life Makan leverages on the familiar setting of the HDB Void Deck. So as someone who grew up in a public housing setting, the everyday kind of a community space here becomes really special. And the power of design in place and programming here really reframes the role of these seniors from object of charity to the stewards uh, of our community. Uh, and what makes this difference from the traditional model of care is instead of volunteers visiting them, so the seniors come down to help themselves and help others. So the design here was strategic where we engaged the seniors to work with us in the planning of, of the spaces here and through this build trust with them and also activate that notion of sense of self-worth 
and build this stronger sense of community over time. So porosity is key in reinforcing this sense of inclusivity where the center is seamlessly connected with the surrounding streets. So in space, we wanted to retain the porous and open characteristics of the void deck that promotes good ventilation, daylight, and in outlook. So instead of uh, the typical gated or, uh, or even glazed up uh, senior centers we see quite common, the facade of the centers is designed with an array of uh, openable full height doors that allows us to retain that cross ventilation, but more importantly, it creates an inviting edge and welcomes uh, these visitors. And significantly here, it blurs the boundary between the inside and outside of the centers with the surrounding linkways, which helps to reduce the marginalization of this demographic group. And in utilizing the space, we wanted to preserve the character and retain this as a key space for social interaction and community bonding. Internally, an array of vibrant colors and textures add interest to the center, shifting away from the typically muted palette associated with senior centers. And a rich palette is also deployed in the internal storage, and spatially, the colors are injected to help functionally to zone the activity centers from seniors who are also suffering from mount dementia. So the specially designed infographics and signages also further break down language barrier for seniors from different race to create a more inclusive setting for all. The needs and aspirations of the communities are always evolving. And in fact, uh, we capitalized on the COVID period uh, when the center is closed for safety measure and took the opportunity to update and refresh the facilities to reach out to more seniors and wider community adding a cafe, a day nursing station, and also introduce greenery. And we're also looking at the network of centers in Marine Terrace with Good Life to see how we can enhance this setting and, and capitalize on the power of network. So small uh, is beautiful here. Uh, the idea of this project, though modest in scale, is big in aspiration. I wanted just to end off uh, with the story of Uncle Louis, one of the stay alone seniors, the one in purple. So Uncle Louis shared that prior to the whole conception of the project, when uh, the group came to him and asked for help, uh, asked to offer help to him, his straight answer was no. When, uh, when Good Life was created, they reached out to him and asked Uncle Louis if he can come down and help others, help himself. He said, let's do it. So from injecting life to the void deck to enriching lives of these seniors through the capacity of design, Good Life Makan reframes the roles of these seniors, reconnect them and empower them, importantly, to be active participants of our community. Through purposeful programming and design, we can enhance physical, mental, and very importantly, psychological health of not just our seniors, but the larger community. That, thank you. Thank you for that, architect Xia Chi Huang. Last but not least, our final PDA 2020 recipient featured today is the urban tropical village for seniors, Kampong Admiralty. Architect Pearl Chi is a director for WOHA and she leads its design project team in design execution and implementation of innovative and award-winning private and public projects. She will share with us how the successful integration of programs not only enables seniors to lead independent and active lives, but also draws in families, friends, and the public to create a vibrant community hub. Architect Chi, over to you, please. Thank you very much, um, Audrey. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm presenting Kampong MRT. Um, the theme of this project is connection and integration. I'll jump straight to a series of design diagrams to explain the layering of the different programs. The site is next to an MRT station and site area is about uh, one hectare. The project brief has four key components, commercial and medical center, community programs, and public housing for the elderly. There are facilities run by different um, government agencies and co-locating them at this um, strategic location gave rise to opportunity for co-programming. Um, 
our first key move was to put the supermarket, the retail shops and food centre on the ground level by compacting the commercial footprint over two floors. We free the ground floor for a tropical plaza. And our next move was to overlay the large footprint of the medical centre over the plaza. This provides shade and shelter, which is crucial for its usability in the tropics. By lifting the medical centre to the mid-layer, all weather activities can now take place in a fully uh, public, porous and pedestrianised plaza below. The high volume also allows natural daylight and breezes through, ensuring a high degree of thermal comfort for people. Our next key move then was to overlay the community use of a quieter nature, um, such as the childcare, the elder care, and the public housing to the upper layer. And over this, we created a new elevated ground level by introducing a community sky park where young and old can come together. This park with the gardens and urban farms adopts a topographic architectural language of terraces and hills. And at the foot hill of the park, we introduced the apartment blocks of public housing for elderly. The hills effectively shielded the apartments from the MRT train noise. So instead of uh, standalone programs, we have created a layer integrated urban village. I'm going to just move on to the actual building section and some images to show you what has been built. Um, this is the building section, the basement uh, for vehicle parking. Uh, we move up the next layer. The lower layer comprises two floors. Um, the ground floor is a porous tropical plaza that brings the community together and is designed to prioritize pedestrian circulation through the building to the train station. The plaza is a bright and breezy double volume space that serves as a community living room. It is activated by shops and a food center on the upper level. Uh, we have oculus in the middle that opens up to the light, air and views of the sky park at the upper levels. The plaza now is a popular social space uh, and provides daily convenience to residents. In the middle layer, we spread the medical center over two floors. The footprint covers almost the entire site and all the internal waiting and circulation areas are organized around a center garden courtyard. Architecturally, it is like an umbrella sheltering and shading the tropical plaza below. And it is also acting uh, as a supporting floor for the landscape above. The rain garden courtyard brings natural daylight and green into the interiors, which helps to promote healing and well being. Now, the upper layer of the building is a new elevated ground level for the more quiet and private uh, community facilities. So, this is um, actually a view out of the window of the uh, elderly apartments, which looks towards the sky park. And at this level, childcare and senior care are side by side and also adjacent to landscape outdoors. So this adjacent school programs brings the young and old together, encouraging intergenerational bonding. And they share the new ground level for outdoor exercises and playgrounds. And the idea of locating the urban farm on the rooftop encourages the elderly to be active and socialize with others while taking care of the community farm but leaves and ramps are provided to help the persons using wheelchairs. Now, lastly, the housing blocks for the elderly. Um, in terms of floor plans, it's eight units per floor. The units are modular and designed with barrier-free access. We arrange them in pairs with uh, buddy nooks at shared entrances for neighbors to sit, chat, and care for each other. This is a view of the housing blocks um, growing as it were out of the sky park and surrounded by its large landscape. The buddy nooks are actually benches that were designed to encourage interaction at the shared entrances of each pair of apartments. Um, they face each other and main doors uh, in housing flats are usually kept open for ventilation. And in this case, it actually helps to keep watch over each other. This is my last slide. 
the project was opened in 2018 and it's uh, very successful. And I'm happy to, to see the HDB starting to adapt this prototype in future towns. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Architect G, and thank you to all our recipients for sharing on your inspiring and delightful projects. I'll now hand the time over to our moderator, Architect Larry Ung, once again, for the question and answer session. Please welcome Larry and the recipients. Thank you, Audrey. I'm sure all of you are inspired by their design thought, their design processes, and what they have achieved in the end. So um, we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to start uh, directing some questions, perhaps to everybody. Maybe the first question goes to Peng Beng and uh, Belinda, uh, perhaps Alan and Sito. If anybody else wants to answer, by all means, this is a conversation. So design should start with people's needs. Given that communities often have diverse needs, how can designers and architects balance these different requirements to create satisfactory outcomes for everyone? Any takers? Oh, well, maybe we can go. Yeah. So for, for us, uh, we love to work in this kind of uh, multi-contextual uh, settings where there are many different stakeholders. Uh, and we have learned uh, uh, that uh, the art of listening and dialogue is uh, so important. Mm -hmm. And we use different different tools to, uh, to, to get uh, feedback, sometimes uh, workshops using post-it pads and sometimes just drawings and all sorts of different ways. I think the important thing is that architecture is a little bit like an, or the, the act of design is a lot like a, a pulling an orchestra together or maybe boiling a good a herbal soup, you know. You put all <laughs> the ingredients and to figure out the soup <laughs> and we try not to be the ingredients but maybe be the soup. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and actually, actually, um, the the fact that we don't really need to do the balancing, but I do, I do find ourselves, um, needing to facilitate the conversations between the communities, because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will be using the space together, and it won't be us. So it's about maintaining again, maintaining their connection with each other, and actually, uh, honoring what each one has to say, and then um, really answering to their needs. Yes, I do agree. In fact, I pick up your keyword, the art of listening. <laughs> All architects must have the art of listening. Otherwise, it's going to be challenging for you to translate <laughs> the, uh, the brief from the clients into what they truly want to get in the end. So the art of listening is very important. So Alan and Sito, do you have your take or do you also agree? Uh, yeah, but uh, I perhaps will take a different angle and also kind of reframe your questions that obviously, and also the topic of the discussion impacts lives, right? Design impact lives. The more lives you impact, the more lives you improve, the better, right? And interestingly, houses, who do you impact? For us, house impact immediately the household, six person plus domestic helpers. And in that context, and also relevant to many young designers, start off with I mean, houses, small interiors. Then does that mean that, okay, my work doesn't impact lives? The important thing it would be then, how do we project that? How do doing single family houses that immediately impact the lives of the family, but how, how about lives of others? Is that the potential of that, which is what we are very interested in? As we see, houses occupies our entire uh, interest in architecture. You know, single-family houses from Miss Vanderloo's Farnsworth Pass, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waters, they have impact the generation of, of, of houses and house designers and how one will live, right? The, and I think that is, that is something that we feel through even a single-family house that impact the immediate families. How would that be the design contributions? How could that be extended? How would we be adding to the conversation and the dialogue of architectural discourse that in some way we contribute in our, you know, in a bigger discussion or a deeper discussion that will influence others? And I think the PDA is one good platform that, that kind of like verified that effort, that the ambition that we have. Yeah. 
Wonderful. At least we know that uh, PDA is the uh, it's something that everybody can look towards through towards and also something that you can um, finally motivate all of you to do even better. Now, um, let me direct uh, the next question to uh, Zuyin and Prashant. Both Italian Green School and Sparkle Thoughts Large Preschool focus on creating an experiential learning experience as well as play outside the classrooms. What are the design elements that led to this common objective? And what can it be said about the future of educational facilities for young children? Preston? Fine, if I, if I go first. So, okay. uh, yeah, Larry, thanks, thanks for the question. I think, yeah, yeah uh, right, you're right. I think the focus of early childhood pedagogy has shifted from mm. uh, inside classroom thinking to more of outdoor learning. I, I think that's a, that's a great trend because um, as I mentioned earlier, when the kids are so young, um, they don't learn from reading ABCs. They learn from experiential experience, experiencing the, the, the nature, the wind, the rain by touching tactile. And um, what is a greater teacher than nature in a way? So um, they learn more from from far, uh, doing farming, touching the soil, mm. and playing phones even. Um, so so that, that at the young age, these memories really will imprint themselves in their minds. And um, also, I, I suppose uh, the other benefit from getting from that is like, um, they will learn to appreciate nature when they grow up and it will manifest in, uh, mm. in other ways, um, respecting the environment, for example, and um, it will give rise to a new trend of thinking, hopefully. And uh, so, so that, that is, um, yeah, what I have to say about that. So I, I, I think it's, it's a really a good trend. And um, ECDA, Early Childhood Development Agency, is really uh, pushing this uh, approach for, for subsequent child care from now on. For sure, I agree with you, because if you want to learn anything, you need to experiential learning is definitely um, trump over spoon feet the, the children. I remember when I was in Australia, they were saying that in many of the cities, it's a bit more challenging for them to do what you say, experiential learning. But in Australia, if you want to know about a cow, go milk a cow in that sense, you know what I mean? So actually doing the actual action Prashant, you have something else to add on? Because yeah, yours is a very interesting school. <laughs> yeah, I want to make, make maybe two comments. Firstly, I think for Itania school, uh, it wasn't about creating an outdoor environment for experience, right? For us, the building is part of the landscape and it allows the flexibility where the classrooms become the playground or the dance mm -hmm. studio or the theater studio and the outside becomes a classroom if it's not raining or if it's not too hot. So the entire site is actually the outside and inside. And I, I've actually observed the teachers using it that way as well. So I think our, our perspective was, uh, was really to push the boundaries on, on really creating a seamless environment uh, for the kids, the teachers, and the parents uh, to be able to come together and, and experience the school. Uh, on, on your point regarding uh, the future of education, I think uh, uh, we all understand and we all believe that experiential learning is the way to go. And, and, and what Zhu Yin just mentioned about playing in sand and stuff is mentioned. But if you look at the environment around us, we become so perfectionist and so protective that we actually in reality do not want to provide that environment, right? We, we see astroturf in school, uh, we see limited time that people kids spend outside. And even the experiential learning is often on iPad and use of technology uh, and it's, it's become an aid and it's not about self-learning. So I think the goal for future should be more giving the freedom and really shake off all these uh, inhibitions that we have in terms of creating an environment which is constructed every time and let the nature and children build their own environment and not be so structured and so fearful all the time. And I don't think we are moving in that direction, but I would like us to move in that direction. 
I'm sure, slowly and steadily, I'm sure, I do believe the world is the playground. So there's lots to learn in that. Thank you. I uh, now move on to Pearl and uh, Ji Huang. Kampong Emirati as an integrated public housing development for seniors. It's a very good prototype for cities with aging societies. Good Life Makan is a senior activity center also known for its groundbreaking design concept and successful prototype to purposefully reintegrate stay alone elderly back into the community. So what are the key challenges when designing for seniors from different backgrounds? For both of you. Ladies first, go. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fast. In, in the modern day, um, anyone goes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, there is, uh, there's already tools to help us uh, navigate how to design inclusively for people with different uh, abilities. So when you say different, you know, uh, seniors, probably, uh, I, for example, universal design guides and, and so on, they are very good, good tools to help us. Uh, but um, I want to also uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, another um, face to the question, which is uh, in the course of designing the project, actually the, the whole project team was thinking about the aging issues. Um, and this came up because we, we always in our society or in Singapore, we probably look to take care of um, elderly when they are very sick and very old. So this project actually caused us to think about uh, what happens before they grow old and weak. We are doing something before they're growing old and weak. So um, that's why there was a lot of um, community spaces that links them. There is a, a lot of thinking about how to co-program uh, the young and the old together. Yeah, so it's to really help um, the elderly uh, grow old independently and socially also more connected. Okay, uh, aging gracefully in place, yeah, in a way. Yeah. All right, uh, Chi Huang? Yeah. So uh, thanks, just really to add on to Pearl's point. Uh, I think the obvious challenge with regards to designing for seniors as Pearl shared, uh, I think fundamental rules of universal design friendly for uh, not just seniors, but people of all uh, ability or disability. I think, but a very important part is this idea of not just being attractive, but familiarity. I think it's actually very key for some of these seniors. And I, I must applaud uh, PDA, not just because you are all my friends, right? And, and the agencies here, but clustering these projects together. Like, uh, because when, when I looked at uh, the challenges of Kampong Emirati and Good Life Makan, uh, but or you can almost draw parallel, but very connected world. Kampong Emirati is like a hub where uh, Good Life is like a spoke. And this is a big building node, while the other works as a network. One is newly created, and the other is integrating with existing fabric. But it's very important that the two work as an entire ecosystem of care for the seniors, because the whole idea is not about looking at one versus the other. In fact, it's very important that one works very well with the other so that we can tackle and address challenges that say one institution cannot kind of fulfill and in the case of good life, because it's not about uh, material and physical needs, because they, they are already staying at the rental blocks right above, it's actually really moving into that um, emotional and psychological needs. And, and it's funny that uh, Ping Ping Belinda, uh, last week we just talking about the Maslow uh, needs, a hierarchy of needs. And here it's actually not just restoring the, the seniors about these aspects of uh, way before uh, beyond basic, not about even self-actualization, because this is pushing to the self-transcendence needs, because they are helping others. It's beyond yourself. And, and hence, from there, uh, you empower and restore that key part of self-worth 
for, for the seniors. And in that sense, that was uh, really, I would say, is the essence. But one very important part is, I think as seniors, when I'm imagining I'm growing old, I also don't want the, the, the whole brand of aging to be over-institutionalized. Because sometimes it is a problem. I think this whole state of normalcy, that like aging is part of our natural landscape. Then we see kids from sparkle thoughts in nature setting at this school, uh, attending school is it's so critical that we have more blend rather than compartmentalize or institutionalize them. Yeah, these are my yeah. thoughts. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I uh, totally agree with you. In fact, uh, for, for most of you, a lot of ways of achieving a creative solution, it's more a holistic and integrated approach uh, in some of you that have said. Now we have about 600 attendees today and uh, maybe I should open up the, some questions um, to those attendees. Um, let's say, um, I should say answer live, right? Answer live. <laughs> okay, uh, I have this, uh, let me see. Oh, the first question is, uh, The first question is not there already. Okay, maybe uh, the next question. Architect Xia Chi Huang's design to utilize and activate the space at the void deck of our HDB is very edifying for our spaces and the lives of the users. Should we encourage the authority to roll this concept out to further optimize the space even more? So for the spaces available and suitable, of course. Anyone want to uh, add on? Perhaps Ji uh, Huang, uh, you have the experience. So what do you think? Yeah, I didn't want to hop the mic. <laughs> but I think uh, as I shared earlier, uh, a void deck is a very essential and integral part of our public housing landscape. So it's a space that's very special. In fact, uh, not just about such a senior activity center, but the whole, uh, how we curate this space to also retain its core characteristics of being open, porous, is, is very, very critical. And, and how do we also ensure we evolve the design or rather the, the non-design of void decks uh, also becomes a key, uh, I would say, design challenge for many of the friends and uh, here and online, uh, so that it continues to add value and add richness in the way we look at um, our homes and living environment. Yeah, I'll just probably stop there first. Yeah. Any other addition from anyone? But I would say generally, even HDBs are also engaging the community themselves and even do have programs to ask the community what do they want to do with their spaces around them. So I think this is uh, something that is already uh, ongoing. And, and that's why even N Parks has uh, the, what do you call, um, community bloom programs where there's so many now, more than a thousands of the community gardens, um, especially those among the HDB flats. So a lot of things are in some way uh, flexible. It's a, it's a matter of uh, engagement and what's best for the people community in that region. Uh, let me um, post another question from the um, the uh, public, uh, which is more contemporary. I would like to hear from the panel on their thoughts about how COVID-19 has affected the way they design buildings and internal spaces. Given that we are in the new norm, should design be drawn to suit these or be done in the hope that things will return to the way they were? Well, it's an interesting question, which is very contemporary. We are all now in the heightened alert, and I'm sure it affects many of you in your work, in your social life, and so. Anyone want to attempt to add? Uh, yes, Prasun, you want to say something? 
Yeah, I think in our case, uh, uh, we are currently building some houses in the Philippines. Uh, and we see that the, the fact that the work from home uh, is become quite normal mm. uh, and the ability to interact and work through the internet is really creating a leveling level playing field where you can be in any part in a remote part of the world and you could have similar opportunities to being like in a big city. And we think that when we work in very remote and difficult communities with very limited opportunities, uh, the COVID-19 is creating a new wave, which we would want to tap onto and ensure that the people that we work with have can take the advantage of it. So some of the houses we are designing, we are ensuring that uh, we, we, we work with some internet community providers for good internet facilities, their work from home facilities. Uh, while we do are create, continuing to create public spaces as well, because we do think, I mean, at the end of the day, some things will do, go back to normal. But I think from a work education standpoint, uh, we are addressing to those changes to create new opportunities. Uh, okay. Nair, uh, yeah. uh, add on. For, for us, I think uh, we have uh, been rethinking how we build complexity and complex systems. So uh, rather than uh, looking, you know, just uh, purely as a, a big, uh, project, we tend to look at them uh, in parts that come together to form a whole. So very uh, much having an ecological uh, um, uh, function. So if let's say we are designing a big hall, we will try to make small little halls that could be separated or could be combined together. So that, that level of um, flexibility uh, where you can connect and as well as separate uh, makes it a lot more resilient than just a typical hierarchy. Yeah, I think uh, if I just add to that, right, I, I hear what uh, what you're saying, Prasoon, and I, I actually agree with it, that that we actually, there is a new norm and then we are just getting so used to being talking to each other in this sort of uh, technological platform. But I think at the end of the day, we are still created to have a relationship, a face-to-face -face relationship. So rather than, than be overly focused on a disease, um, that is how do we really maximize um, that kind of face-to-face -face and opportunities to come together um, um, in, in the new design as well. Yeah, I agree. There is really no right or no wrong to, uh, to these uh, answers to these questions. Uh, what is more important is continuing conversations because I read the articles. There are two schools of thought. One school says that, oh, okay, because we have been working from home now, they, they, they probably do not need um, uh, more officers and, and all that. So therefore, lots of changes would, would be impacted on the environment. Um, the other school of thought is that, um, just like what uh, Belinda says, I mean, you're working at home on your own, but human beings are generally gregarious in nature and you need to meet up, you need to socialize and, and all that. So, well, who is right, who's wrong? There are these two articles, two school of thoughts are from many, many different people. So I think what's important is for all of us as designers, do get together and continue the conversation. I think that is very important. Yes? yes. Anyone else want to add on? Uh, maybe not, I add that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, coming from the experience of um, designing a few child cares, you know, um, <clears throat> I shared upon this idea of flex design flexibility as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a small thing like, a, you know, a, a handful mouth, but um, those lessons are actually taken on and uh, in the subsequent child cares that we are designing, uh, actually we are told to seriously look into the ideas of um, flexibility alternate entrances um, and also so that we can really pivot from a full on uh, uh, mode where all the students come or the, the, uh, when something happens, um, part of them come. So I, I think I agree with um, Belinda that, and, and Larry so that uh, you know, humans are social creatures. We will certainly want to meet face to face and in my, in my uh, uh, example, you know, the, 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 the children really want to play with their friends and um, doing it virtually, it just doesn't, uh, it's just not there. So uh, we will, con moving forward, architects still need to design for places of uh, community and congregation, but um, 
we have to design in, a, in, 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 in mind of the alternate modes and um, flexibility so that uh, the, the architecture itself can really adapt to circumstances when it happens. That, that's a, uh, yeah, my point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we hope these, all of you as uh, top designers should continue this conversation because um, we will be probably looking and discussing more on post-COVID new normal. So what is considered the new normal spaces? I think SIA can actually even organize lots of debates on this because uh, it is very interesting project. I have a comment from Chi Kian. Uh, um, he says that the void deck did not start as off as void in its early years. There were many... Um, Oh, hang on, this suddenly goes up some way. Oh, they will, it just disappeared from my screen. Okay. There were many, uh, what do you call, mama shops, libraries and all that. But actually, if you, if you look at, um, um, that, it, there's, there's a lot. I was from HTV for quite a while. There were many reasons why void decks were created. One of the more important reasons is that void deck it's void and it's very unique to Singapore public housing HDB flat. I think not many places else have this. And when you have the void that it's very useful. It can be used in terms of emergency or even non-emergency to be converted to spaces like the Good Life Makan or something else. So it supplements very, very immediately. And uh, that's why in HDB, in HDB planning, the planning or the of the HDB flat is a checker box. So there are reserve site in between. Should there be a need somewhere, a reserve site can also be activated. So it's the same uh, principle. Um, let me see. Okay, maybe this is more devoted to Pearl. Maybe Pearl can just a quick summary. Government agency has many committees and thus has many voices. Can Woha share the experience navigating them and creating this wonderful project? It's a very good question. <laughs> Actually, the this project we work with seven agencies, and um, in we we had a very um, uh, strong steering committee. Work, I mean, the project team and the clients team. Um, I think what is uh, very very useful and critical to uh, to the success is that. Uh, there is a principle that everybody uh, agrees on, which is to that the whole is better than the parts because agencies bring their, their, their organizational excellences to the table, but really you need to be able to tell them to have this a vision, a whole vision that, that rises above individual uh, organization excellences. Yeah. So I think that's very important to, to remember as a principle yeah, of driving the project. Okay, thank you. I'm very mindful mm. of the time. Uh, there was one comment, I think, which I think, Prashant, you have uh, uh, answered. Who funds the Billion Bricks project? Do you have to raise fund? I think, Prashant, you mentioned Billion Bricks projects are donor funded. Yes, we have to raise fund. Okay. All right. Um, there's one or two more also quite related to what I've asked uh, uh, Pearl. Let me check whether if there's any more. Uh -huh. This is a very interesting one. And for years, I think many of us, uh, whether urban designer, urban planners or architects are always trying to do. Maybe if we, 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 we can just say a few words as uh, the last input for today's forum. Uh, it's from an Anonymous. It says, how can the true kampong spirits be sustained and enhanced in the built environment by future designers? Even if we don't have any takeaway for this, uh, just bear the questions and uh, think about it all the time. Uh, does anybody want to say about Kampong spirit. Um, I kind of want to say something. I'm, I'm sure. 
Yeah. So um, as he is linked to a, a series of questions, including Chi Ken's comment about the void deck, I mean, we have Leong talking about Chi Huang's design and whether the agencies should encourage it. And then you have Chi Ken talking about what the original void deck is actually used for. It's a mini library. It's, it's everything. So it's like a, a village square so to speak. So I think um, the Kampong spirit can only come in if it is, if, if, if we can encourage, so whether it's the agencies that does it or, or developers that does it, uh, we need to remove some of the silos. We need to remove this space is for the elderly and that space is for the childcare. We need to break these boundaries. And of course, architecturally, we can do that. Uh, we see we see uh, Chiwan doing that, breaking the priority. We see uh, Woha doing that. We see Pearl doing that. But, but at the end of the day, there is also the software, the thinking behind new pedagogies that need to come in. It shouldn't be the kids singing to the elderly, but can there be a program? program where both are actually, um, you know, they can all be in one space and supported together. So the whole village square has to happen. Okay, any other take up? Because this is a topic that I don't think in the modernization of Singapore or urbanization of Singapore, uh, I wouldn't say we have completely lost the Kampong spirit, but definitely there are opportunities where we need to think about it to bring back what is known as kampong spirit. Um, I lived in a kampong long before, but you see the difference in, in, in living in a kampong. As you walk the path, you will come to every different uh, houses. You walk past them and you say hello to them and you get to know them better and they don't lock the door. The doors are always open. So that is a bit different. So when HDB in the 80s created what we call courtyard in the sky, the new generation flats where you have six to eight units sharing a big common corridor with bigger spaces, it's actually meant to create spaces for interaction. But actually the lift lobby is one of the best places to, to create for interaction. So um, we have not successfully bring the spirit, kampong spirit into the new flats, but there are always uh, many areas that I think we can look at it uh, so to, to some success. But this is a question which I think all designers will probably, especially when you talk about designing for community. So this is one that we all have to take away with us and think about it. Any last intake before we uh, I hand over to Audrey? You know, uh, Larry, uh, whether yeah. I can still answer that Kampong question. Yeah, I mean, sure. some of us have the benefit of experiencing it. I mean, my uncle had that uh, pig farm and I mean, I used to at least remember but I think more and more so, it's very important that we define this new idea of a communal living. Because soon our kids who do not have this connection, this word kampong will be very foreign. It will be so abstract. And in fact, it is really talking about this idea of, as you said, sense of community. But more importantly, this idea of trust and relationship. Because you know that the space has no gate. And then they, they talk about, you know, a whole village raising up a child. That's that idea of a collective living. And, and in fact, it is uh, for us, again, as a possibly a design uh, question of how can we establish this new idea of communal living as we move forward towards the future and create maybe another term in itself and continue to progress this concept of us coming together uh, as a larger community. Thanks, Ji Huang. I think the conversation has to continue. But definitely uh, for Woha's project, it's called Kampong Emirati. I think that <laughs> is an attempt to really bring the community together. So perhaps we can have more Kampong elsewhere, a modern Kampong, just like the uh, Kampong Emirati. Okay, there's no other thing I like to, uh, I think we way past the time. It's such an interesting uh, uh, conversation, uh, dialogue. 
I'd like to personally thank you all the PDA uh, recipients. And once again, my heartiest congratulations to all the winners, the pinnacles of all design awards. With that, I'll hand over to Audrey. Audrey, over to you. Thanks so much for that, Larry, and all our recipients for sharing your experience with our audience. To our guests, we most definitely hope to see you again next week on the 12th of August for part two of the President's Design Award Recipients Forum, where five of the recipients will share how their designs have sparked transformation in the country, community, and economy. Please scan the QR code for the registration link. We'd also appreciate it if you could complete a short survey for this webinar to help us improve on our future programs. Please scan the QR code for the survey forms. For those of you who would like to apply for CPD points, please also scan the same QR code you see on the left of the screen and submit to your particulars by today. I'll give you a minute to get that started. If you would like to find out a little bit more about the various upcoming programs the National Design Center has lined up, do also scan the QR code that you see on the screen right now. And if you'd like to find out more about the recipients, please visit our website, pda.designsingapore.org. That's pda.designsingapore.org. And with that, we will be ending the session for today. Thank you all once again to all of our speakers and to all of you for choosing to spend your Wednesday afternoon with us. My name is Audrey. Have a great evening ahead. Bye-bye. <laughs>